welcome everyone to the 18th annual Newburyport Literary Festival. My name is Leslie Hendrickson. I'm on the steering committee of the festival. We were back yesterday for our first in real life sessions since the pandemic and we were so thrilled that people came out and the sessions were full and we were so happy to be back in Newburyport. So thanks to all the authors and volunteers who made that possible. And we have adopted the hybrid model for the first time this year. So here we are online. And um, I'm particularly excited about this event. Um, it's bringing uh, two authors together who've written about a similar subject that we would not have been able to bring together had it not been for Zoom. And we'll get to that a little bit later, but that is one of the benefits of this, of being online. Um, I'm gonna uh, give some shout outs to our sponsors. First, the Institutions for Savings and the Newburyport Bank. These are our founding sponsors. They've been with us since 2005. Thank you so much for your support. We've also received funding from the Massachusetts Cultural Council, as well as local council chapters in Newburyport, Newbury, West Newbury, Georgetown, Raleigh, and Salisbury. Thank you so much. The Yellow School was a huge supporter of the festival this year, as was the Mass Center for the Book. And we appreciate that. I also want to shout out our independent bookstore partners, the Bookshop of Beverly Farms and Jabberwocky Bookshop here in Newburyport. I'm gonna put links to their shops in the chat. You can find the books that we're gonna be talking about today and all the books from the festival, plus all your favorites at these independent bookstores. And I also wanna say thank you to A Mighty Blaze. We've been um, live streaming to A Mighty Blaze all day via their Facebook, and we hope that those participates Participants are enjoying it and we appreciate the opportunity to be on that platform. I'm going to introduce our speakers, starting with Kate Sharp Landeck, whose book was on top, which is why I'm reading it first. And here's the beautiful cover, The Women with Silver Wings. She is a professor of history at Texas Women's University, the home of the WASP archives. She is also the vice president of the Wingtip to Wingtip Association, a national nonprofit devoted to the accurate re remembrance of the WASP. A graduate, a graduate of the University of Tennessee, she, where she earned her PhD, she was granted a Guggenheim Fellowship for her WASP research from the Smithsonian National Air, Air and Space Museum. And she's also received numerous award, awards for her work on the the WASP. She, her work has been also published in the Washington Post, the Atlantic, and the Huff Post. And she's a licensed pilot who flies whenever she can. Elena, whom I just met in real life for the first time yesterday at the Newburyport Literary Festival, <laughs> is a local author um, who um, is the author of Mercy House, a library journal best book of the year, the Happiest Girl in the World, and My Body is a Big Fat Temple, a memoir of pregnancy and early parenting. And I think you've discussed all these books here with us. Yeah, this is my fourth festival. <laughs> her, her, her work has also appeared in The Daily Beast, Lit Hub, River Teeth, Slice Magazine, The Rumpus, and Bustle. She teaches creative writing and lives on the North Shore of Boston with her children and Black Lab. So welcome to both. Thank you so much. Thanks for having and, us. Yeah. Thank and you. unlike other um, sessions today, I'm going to stick around and ask you guys some questions. But I think first, let's start with your books. Um, I'd love to hear from each of you, which, uh, you know, just about your books and give us a quick intro. And Kate, yours came out first. So let's start with you. Yeah, well, thanks. Um, uh, you know, basically my book is the story of the women Air Force service pilots from World War II. But I took a different tact. Um, when I came into their story, I first met a wasp, Carol Bailey Bosca, and learned about her flying in the 1950s. You know, she was the 1951 aerobatic champion. And so that's that was kind of my entry point was post-war flying and what they were doing after the war. And then when I started my actual research, and it's a very long story that we don't need to go into how, how long it took and all of that, but um, we have time. <laughs> well, it, I mean, I don't. I, I just want to mention that let, let's not gloss over it entirely because it's a big effort on your part. So, it, well, it 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 was. I you know I met her in 1993 when I was you know like negative 10 years old or something like that, right? But but uh, 
um, I was right out of college and was looking for a direction and wanted to write and loved history and, you know, kind of found my topic uh, with with Caro. And, um, you know, so I, I ended up going to graduate school so I could learn how to write history the right way, you know, really how to do good research, how to get into the archives, how to put it into context um and uh you know write write good serious history nonfiction uh and then the focus obviously became the war years um and that's what my thesis and my dissertation were about was the war years you know first were they good pilots yes they were you know everybody knew they were cool but were they good and then um and then I expanded the dissertation uh a little bit you know to some of the post-war years but but this book is really a story about these women throughout the whole 20th century, because the Wasp was just this two year period of life. And I think that that's why I like Elena's book so much is because it's that what happened to them afterwards kind of kind of story. Who were they? And um, so I start back in the 1920s and the 1930s and set the stage of women in aviation and then these these women in particular and um as Elena knows, there were so many of these women, you know, there were 1800 who went through training and 1102 who earned their wings and flew for the Army Air Forces during the war. And you can't really write a good narrative nonfiction that way. So I chose five to kind of follow through the whole book. So you see them in the 20s and 30s through the war years, which is the bulk of the book. And then the, the final third is that post-war period of, of the 50s and 60s kind of what happened to Rosie the Riveter after the war, right? It, it, we are all told, oh, Rosie went home and had babies and was happy until, you know, the 60s and 70s. It's like, okay, well, what happened to these women? Uh, and that's kind of the direction I took. And then their fight for veterans recognition in the 70s, all the way through um, the Congressional Gold Medal and a Rose Parade float in 2014 and things like that. So it's really, it's, it's almost a group biography a story of their whole lives um, and, and putting them into context of their times for the whole 20th century. So it's it's not just a book about those two years that they're in the war, it's it's kind of their whole whole life story. So it's it, it was three times longer when I wrote it. Um, Elena will appreciate it, it was 300,000 words when I wrote it, the first draft, and then it, it's 108 right now. So it was very painful to cut those two thirds, but it's a much better book. Yes. for it I I know um but but um it's a big story that that I've tried to to tell as concisely as possible and when, when it was those 300 were you including other people's stories as well did you cut yeah. down individuals yeah yeah I had I had um two two other people that were and and I knew all these women so you know, not I didn't know Jackie and Nancy personally but but the others I did and so I had two other women that I had their whole lives and I had them all woven in whole chapters on them that I had to just gut. Right. And you just felt yeah. so responsible for them. Oh, yeah. Like, like you were in there, like, uh, you, like you owed them something, you oh, know? Completely. And, like, oh, completely, man. Completely. Because they helped me so much. And um, some of the pictures that are in the book were chosen because I couldn't include those women. So their, their pictures That's are in the book. Tip, yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah, man. Exactly. Were they understanding when they saw that they were? Um, well, they they had uh, both died right before the book came out, oh. so that was good, but I, I and bad, you know, obviously. Right. But um, their families were not as pleased. Yeah, um, um, but but they understand, and right, especially that tough time. Yeah, yeah. So were you able to send them what you had written? Yeah, yeah. And they they knew me and, and they saw the pictures, which made up for it. And because I did let them know, look, I've had to, you know, she's not a lead anymore, but but they're each in there. You can find their names. And that was that was the biggest thing. But yeah, like, what can you do? I mean, yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it you know, you can't have it this big. And yeah. And it was just the paced so <laughs> it was paced so beautifully. Like, I mean, oh. whatever, every decision that you made was the right decision because like, oh, I that loved... is very generous of you. I, <laughs> it, it, you know, nonfiction is so different in that you've got to get the facts to make the facts make sense. And, and, uh, you know, I love your book, the way you, you lay it out and you go back and forth between the times. And, and I love, love that, that format. And with this, it's so hard to, you 
my students, I teach history and my students always, the big joke is I start World War II in 1870. Right. right? You, gotta, <laughs> you know, you gotta go back and, and um, uh, you know, it, it, uh, it's hard and to not be able to do that and lose the audience. But I love the way you did that with your book. And, but you, you totally did that here. I mean, you didn't start maybe that far back, but you did really set the stage for like why flying was so important when this opportunity came out for these people that they had grown up in the age of aviation. So like all these people were their heroes, you know, like, like yeah. um, Amelia Earhart and um, Charles Lindbergh and like all of these, the Wright brothers, like they were paying to go to air shows. Like, mm -hmm. and these were like exceptional women who knew how to fly. And, and so like how qualified they were and what was at stake and, um, just like how much they revered the activity was just like you had built it in so nicely so that when they, you know, joined the force, we knew how important it was and like how oh. uh, how the, they were so qualified to be there. Thank but, you um, so much. That means so much to me because that was something I really fought to make sure we kept that part in because I thought that was so important. So oh, for um, sure. Yeah, you, you need to know. Thank you for saying that. I appreciate yeah, that. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> Um, yeah, I absolutely thought the same, um, but I'm going to um, ask you, Lena, now to oh, talk a little yeah. bit about your book, and um, sure. I, and we'd love to hear a little bit about what Kate was alluding to, the um, the pacing and the difference in time and, and that kind of thing. Yeah, so yeah, here's, here's Ice Turn Skyward. Um, so it's a dual timeline novel um, where we have the the World War II. We we follow Peggy as she joins the Women Air Force Service pilots and her time through training and then um, in her service and then when they're spoiler alert ultimately dismissed. Mm -hmm. um, and it had like when I had originally written it, it was a full just historical fiction novel from like the beginning of her journey to when they were dismissed and that was it. And I had that book for many years. Um, but then I put it aside for a while. And then I just kept like wondering what would happen to her after, you know, mm -hmm. kind of like what, what Kate had said, like, how would that have haunted her to have been, to have like tasted what, how she could apply her, her skills, mm -hmm. you know, and like how she could make a difference and how she could pursue adventure and how they had already proven themselves capable of doing it. Mm -hmm. And then when it had, and, pro and promised it in a way, which like, I so appreciated Kate talking about this so um, thoroughly in her book about like all the steps that had been made along the way, all mm -hmm. like all their advocates and like all of the, like to, to incorporate them, to fold them into the military as the, like their, their counterparts had that opportunity. Um, but then when that had all fallen through, you know, what would have happened? And so ultimately I ended up writing a, a dual timeline novel um, taking place 60 years later with, um, so we could see kind of the consequences of that generationally with her daughter who is now uh, a middle-aged woman. Um, and when, when her daughter finds out that her mother was a woman Air Force Service pilot and like kind of that revelation um, makes sense to her daughter now why her mother had um, pushed her to be ambitious in the way that she had not been allowed to be ambitious and then why the daughter had then well, Kathy um, had resented her mother for for all of the ways that she had um, been frustrated as a stay-at-home military wife um, and pushed Kathy even though she didn't have this she didn't share her desire for um, pursuing those kinds of dreams and as now that the secret is uncovered um, they're able to try to reconcile um, this kind of damaged relationship as Kathy tries to get her mother the recognition that she uh, so like finally deserves. Great thank you and um, I also Perhaps I should have asked this one before these the others. But Kate, why don't you tell us what the wasps were, just so <laughs> we're all... Oh yeah, so everybody, yeah. It's like, yeah. come on, everybody knows who they are now. <laughs> yeah, so excuse me, folks, I should have asked, we should have got, done that first, but please. That's okay. Um, these are, uh, the, we're, we're talking today about the women Air Force service pilots from World War II. And this was a group of women who was recruited by the US Army Air Forces during the war. They were brought in initially as civilians uh, with the expectation that they would be made part of the military. Um, and they were they were pilots. They initially started as ferry pilots. You know, you think about, we talked about Rosie the Riveter, you, you think about the factories and all those hundreds of thousands of planes that were being built across the country in factories. They needed to be flown to those points of embarkation on both coasts to get to the war in Europe and the Pacific. 
And so you needed pilots to fly those. And we were short of pilots. We didn't have enough um, men, you know, and the men we did have, we needed to go overseas to fly in combat. So they recruited these women to, to do this work um, as ferry pilots initially. And then they figured out, oh, wait, these women could maybe do other things that need to be done. Because there was a lot of domestic flying that needed to be done. Uh, towing targets behind airplanes to train gunners on the ground. Uh, just just all sorts of, of different flying that needed to be done. And so they expanded the women's role uh, after you know a good six months of them actively flying and doing a good job, uh, expanded the role into um, other other types of work, and it was similar work that uh, there was a group of men call it pilots called service pilots that were flying for the Army Air Forces that were doing the same type of work, and so these were the women service pilots. Uh, but General Hap Arnold really liked good acronyms, so they added the Air Force in there, so you'd have a good acronym of WASP. Uh, for the for the whole thing, so so they did all sorts of work, and and then they they trained first in Houston, uh, and then in Sweetwater, Texas, was which is where uh, Elena has her book kind of open uh, down there. Once we get to the historic part, um, so it's it's a uh, you know you had eleven hundred and two women earn their earn their wings, thirty eight of them died uh, during the war uh, while doing this work, and um, just really an amazing group of women. But they had no one had thought that the that they could do it right. Like there was a, or there was a lot of doubt that women were capable um, of flying, like you know these military aircrafts. Um, but then they proved themselves to have like the same or higher actually a retention rate in the training program than men and fewer accidents. Um, and but and something that I had learned from your book was that um, I knew that when they when they died for those thirty eight women that um, that had you know died in accidents or on missions, um, they I knew that they their funerals weren't paid for and they often had mm -hmm. to collect money from their peers to send their bodies home and they weren't given you know, military funerals. But I believe in your book um, you mentioned that the that the military. Um, paid ten thousand dollars is that right to to men who died um mm -hmm. and the, the women who like these women got like 200 or something like that um yeah they got the civil service death benefit because they were technically civil service yeah right unequal pay until death <laughs> yeah yeah um, yeah so they were all advised to get insurance um and and they would take part of their pay to to get insurance to pay for that and you know, those funerals, um, Jackie Cochran actually paid to send the bodies home uh, for most of them. Uh, wow. Any of those who died in training, for sure, Jackie and her husband, Floyd Odlum, who was the richest man in America at the time, um, they paid to send the bodies home, um, which I right. think is, wow. is interesting. I didn't know that either. And then um, and then they didn't, they also were, were didn't get, because they weren't in the military when the war ended, they didn't get veterans benefits or the or benefits right. from the GI Bill and um, that's right. Right. And things like That's that. Right. And the, the male counterparts that you mentioned, um, their structure was that after a 90 day probation, they were folded in. Right. So mm -hmm. like, even though yeah. they they had these limitations at the beginning, if they proved themselves within three months, then they were accepted. Whereas these women served for two years mm -hmm. and, and never made it. Yeah. And the, and the expectation was that, that especially with those first ferry pilots that came in, that after 90 days, they would be brought in as second lieutenants. Um, and then things got messy uh, because these were women and it's like, well, do we fully integrate them into the Army Air Forces? How do we house them, right? That's a huge issue with even women in the military today is if you've got one woman on a base, where does she live, right? And, and everything down to toilets. Do we have enough toilets for the women or do we just have urinals? And, you know, so it was really, um, it was complicated because they didn't know what to do with women in a, in a uh, you know at an airbase, so so it was interesting. The, I I have a question that that was further down in my lineup, but this is sort of a good segue into it, which is, were either of you getting extremely frustrated or angry on behalf of of the, these women who have you know working so hard, being so brave, and frankly being treated so poorly? Elena, can I said to Elena, I'm curious to see what you, oh. you have to say. Sure, yeah. I mean, so I started, I, I I didn't like set out to write about the WASP. I didn't even know about them when I, like, I was just kind of looking for 
another writing project and I thought I would write about my great aunt Peggy um, and like, that's something that she had done in the 50s. So I was just kind of researching the 50s, like kind of trying to get a feel of the era because I had never written a historical piece before. And I just kept kind of Wikipedia looping back and landed on these on the wasp. And I was um, 30, 26 at the time. I'm 36. It's been 10 years since I started. Um, and I had, you know, gone through all my schooling and like the, it had never, mm -hmm. it had, I had never, I thought wasps were bees and white Anglo-Saxon. Right. <laughs> <like costumes. laughs> um, so, so yeah, so I, the more I read about them, I like, I just kept researching and researching and, um, and unfortunately, like, you know, 10 years ago, especially there wasn't like the information mm -hmm. was not readily accessible. Yeah. Um, like like uh, this, I mean, the, you should, everyone should read Kate's book. It's like everything <laughs> that is, there is to know. <laughs> and, or, and Elena's. And yes, well, um, and apparently not everything because you're 200,000 words shy. <laughs> yeah. Everything. But there's so much between like that, that is hard. It's hard to get this information. Yeah. Um, this is not like readily, you know, Google it. It's there. Um, so, but I did stumble upon, and I'm sure you're aware of um, Nancy Parrish is sponsored. Mm -hmm. website. Yeah, she did a really good job with her website. Yeah. Yes. So that was my own, that, that was like my information. I did get a couple like autobiographies about the wasp on Amazon and like a couple other, you know, wherever I can get my hands on it, I, I did, mm -hmm. but that was like the central um, it's a website where like there's all this the, the primary source materials of like you know lyrics of songs that they sing and um you know like the, the flight checklists and things like that um but yeah and, and, and Nancy's the daughter of a wasp um so she's got that a really tight connection yes and it's it's like I mean my mine's a mother daughter um like really mm -hmm. wasp relationship and this hers I assume is like the antithesis of like <laughs> two women who are very transparent and supportive and like rooting yeah. each other on. Um, but to answer Leslie's question, um, yes, like, you, I mean, you could probably hear it in my voice every time. Like, I love raising all of these like injustices mm -hmm. that they faced, like the menstruation studies that that they conducted to see if like having your period was causing more accidents. Um, mm -hmm. It wasn't. Um, but yeah, like all of these little things that like, you just I just can't believe or like you know like Jackie having and this I learned from your book um Jackie having to bring them to church because and mm -hmm. like I knew that everyone thought they were prostitutes brought to the base to service the men but yeah. I didn't realize like how much until I read your book that Jackie was trying to fight to have them have like a, a reverent image because there was yeah. already so much working against them so she made them all go to church with the mm -hmm. families so that they would seem more proper even yeah. like the Jewish ones yeah um, but but yeah like they just like like showing up and doing a good job was not enough. They had to like mm -hmm. prove themselves so above and beyond, including like, I mean, I mean, to the point where like other men couldn't do what they did and they had, they were like brought to those other bases to sh like shame the men into flying so that they would have to see that, you know, these women can do it and you're right. too- it's so easy to fly, even a girl can do it. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. But yes, now I want to hear the answer to your question because you actually met and know these women. Yeah, I, I, I appreciate it. And I always want to hear, you know, people who come into it from, from you know, Google, you know, and, and, and how they find their information and how they do it. And, and yeah, Nancy Parrish's website is fantastic. Uh, Texas Women's University has the archives and they've, since you started your work, they've gotten much more digital. They've put tens of thousands of photographs online, letters, diaries, all of that. So for people watching who want to go and look at some of those primary sources, that's another great source. Um, but, you know, I had a little different experience because I, I started by knowing these women, right? They were in their 70s when I met them. And I got to know them. I mean, I'm still friends with, there's a couple of 102 year olds I have regular phone calls with here. Um, but, but, you know, they worked very hard to downplay all the negative because they were afraid I was some young 23 year old going to come in and, you know, oh, just want to hear the bad stories. And so it took several years before they would talk about it in a negative way. They would talk about what they had hoped or what they expected or what they were promised. It took even more years. And I think me getting a little older before they talked about harassment or any anything like that. So it was really, um, you know, when they started telling their story, they wanted to just tell the heroic parts, right? Cornelia Fort was the second one to die. Uh, one wasp died in training. 
uh, but Cornelia Fort was the first active duty one. So she's often remembered the most and very experienced pilot and all those things. And when she died, her family put a flag on her coffin because, you know, she'd been serving in the Army Air Forces and they put a flag on her coffin, even though they weren't supposed to, you know. Um, so those are the kinds of stories that the women told in the beginning was these kind of heroic, no, it wasn't so bad kind of things. And and then you start reading more and you read the primary sources and you read about um, the different experiences and and, you know, after time, when they keep seeing you over and over again, right, the, the, uh, they trust you more. And when they realize you're not going to just tell some sensational story that you really want to know um, what they're doing, then then they'll tell you some of those darker things. And yeah, I mean, so much of it was was unfair. But when you when you'd say that to these women, you know, uh, we had pretty regular cocktail hours. They were all good, uh, you know women of that generation and, and kind of, you know, gin and tonics were the thing, Cuba Libres, right? And, and um, you know, they'd say, you know, who would have thought we'd ever get to fly those things, right? And, you know, they talk about, from the perspective of a 70-year-old and 80-year-old, they say, I was 20 years old flying a P-51. You know, who can who gets to do that, you know? And and it was just amazing that they let us girls in those planes. And so while many of them, it, most of them recognize that, you know, unfairness of those post-war years, right? Especially, and the unfairness of those 38 not being treated right and, and all of that, they all, in the end, of the day were grateful they just had the chance to do the flying and to prove that women could do it and and inspire later generations and um so that's that's hard you know as a historian and as a friend of these women to look and say i cannot believe you didn't get the gi bill you know because i know several who have said to me if i just gotten the gi bill i could have gone to college or i could have you know, had the veterans preference points and kept this job that I loved and, and things like that. So they didn't speak of the unfairness of it, but they, they lived it. You know, sure. so I mean, like even just to. like every veterans day that followed, yeah. you know, and yeah. like, like so many of their peers, their male peers were veterans and mm -hmm. like, you know, their children then were honoring their fathers and like mm -hmm. whatever yeah. they did, they're, they're not being acknowledged. And and I learned again from your book that 17, like, because in my book, um, you know, like the the wasp marries her commanding officer. Yeah. Um, but I learned in your book that that happened to 17 of them. So th that's like, and like, uh, imagine how many of those then became military, you know, mm -hmm. career military pilots. So those women are now following following their husbands around yeah. the country, like watching what they could do. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Yeah. So Dawn, Dawn Seymour was one of the women that I cut, right? And she was a very dear friend of mine. She lived to be 100 years old. Very sweet. She flew B-17s, right? That big plane behind me. And she was down on a base in Florida, met a wonderful young man and got married. He was a B-17 pilot as well. And so they were on the same base. They were flying their B-17s, having a great life. And then the WASP were disbanded in December of 1944, right? The government decided they had enough men that came back. They didn't need women to do it anymore. They had a whole group of men pilots whining and complaining because, you know, girls had their jobs and things like that. And so all of a sudden on December 21st, she was no longer allowed to walk on the flight line, right? A place she'd been for a year and a half place she'd walked with her husband, a place she she was friends, right? They were all friends, you know, and uh, all of a sudden she was no longer allowed in all in the officer's club. She was no longer allowed all those places she'd been going for a year and a half. And she talked about that moment in time as really difficult uh, because that, oh, wait, I'm now I'm just a wife. Mm -hmm. And that was really, um, really a challenge for sure. Yeah, and that that letter that was sent, that disbanding letter, like the language is just was so like particular, right? Like, yeah. like you wouldn't want to be replacing mm -hmm. these men, right? Like, and that was all Jackie Cochran, 
That was yeah. all Jackie Cochran saying, you know, you wouldn't want to replace the men. You wouldn't want to put them out. Right? Which is so interesting because she was the advocate. Like, it's mm -hmm. like a very, yeah, it's like a very complicated situation where she's yeah. like pushing. But then as soon as she knows that she's going to hit the wall, she like has to, you know, kind of linguistically nuance. I don't know. It's It was, it was a fascinating yeah. letter. But I yeah. think you also pointed out that she was, not an um, untraditional woman, you know, she felt like the women, the wasps could take this place because the men couldn't be there. But, yeah. you know, that she still felt they needed to look like women, they needed to be very pretty and made up like she, she was also a makeup baroness, you know, I did not know that. <laughs> yeah, she owned about. her own business. She, she started right? it from she started her cosmetics company from scratch. I mean, she was a fighter and a great businesswoman. But yes, she wanted her girls to look like girls and be feminine. And, you know, in the beginning, she wanted them to go to the hairdresser once a week. And then they all said, okay, we're all just going to go home. We can't do that. <laughs> um, but but yeah, she definitely had um, she and it's hard to know if it was really like uh, traditional values, right, of appearance and all of those things, or if if she was really just that savvy, mm -hmm. understanding the politics of her time and how mm -hmm. these women would successfully navigate that. Because they were right. doing something that was so outside the parameters of society, right? These were women, not just flying, not just you know, some rich woman flying around the world or doing something. It, these were women serving and flying military airplanes during wartime, right? They didn't go overseas. They never fought anybody, but, but they were flying military planes. And that was so outside the parameters of what anyone thought was possible or acceptable for women that, again, it's, it's hard to know where, where Jackie really stood on things if she was just being practical or if she really right if we're going to win these people women's over women's. you have to be super women yeah right exactly and exactly. then she, and then when she realized that this was a losing battle then like mm -hmm. she's like all right now you guys just have to step down because we tried mm -hmm. the hardest we can but we're not going to get anywhere yeah because and and jackie had a lot of really powerful relationships right she was friends with a lot of generals she you know dwight eisenhower wrote his memoirs at her house right at, on her ranch after he'd served as president and you know these are these are the circles that she ran in and you know she recognized that she was still a woman running in these circles and she could only push back so far before she'd be you know kind of shoved aside as oh that radical woman or whatever so I'm she was very good at playing the game a biopic about her no I know I know that's um so there's a good biography. Um, Doris Rich wrote a good academic book about Jackie um, that that I've, I've enjoyed a lot. I'm actually speaking about Jackie, not to pitch another event, but um, at, the, event? at the hmm. Smithsonian on May 10th, I'm giving oh, wow. a her lecture. Have um, you been approached is, to like to as a consultant to make her like a Hollywood movie? Like that, like when I was reading in your book about her rivalry between. Nancy, like um, Nancy, Nancy Martin, and Jack. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like that seemed like that, like a good HBO series or yeah. yeah. Stop telling everyone about this. <laughs> Selling the good. I'm sure someone right. thought of it. Right. I um, I did have a deal with 20th Century Fox, um, and then the pandemic hit, mm. and everything changed, and Disney bought Fox and all of that. So yeah. I'm, Trying to about, work other channels, but for the but, whole book or just about like that particular plot line. Um, I, I, you know, the the p original pitch was the book, but he, you could see how hard the book would be to do just a feature film because yeah. it's over such a long period of time. So I don't know. We'll see what happens next. But well, good but, luck. Uh, I, could, I could see it. I mean, yeah. Maybe, the, yeah. The, you know, you can you can imagine Jackie and Nancy. So we're talking like because we all know these people and the, a lot of the oh. people watching probably haven't haven't read either one of these books but hopefully we'll read both um so Jackie Cochran was um a famous uh, uh pilot and air racer and businesswoman and she grew up in the sawmills of Florida and Alabama just dirt poor I mean literally dirt poor uh and fought her way up and then Nancy Love was 
a young woman from a much more well-to-do family in Michigan, but long lines to Boston area. Um, very intelligent, very hardworking, great test pilot, did a lot of really good flying. Um, and they knew each other. That I've got a picture in the book that I was so proud to find that proved they knew each other in 36, um, which uh, was exciting. And they were just, they should have been friends, right? These two women should have been friends because they had the same goals. They both thought women could fly and serve in the war. They both thought women could be great, effective pilots. And um, but there was a personality clash there for sure. They cooperated a lot more than they didn't cooperate. Uh, but, uh, and and I, uh, one of the WASP who was a good friend of both of theirs um, sat me down and said, you can't talk about Jackie and Nancy and a rivalry because they were lovely women, both of them. And they we, none of this would have happened without both of them. And she was absolutely right, you know, that they were, um, both essential to the success of this program, but I think she was wrong that there definitely was a rivalry. So it's it's finding that balance between two strong women with different ideas, both ambitious. Um, but yeah, I think I think there are lots of stars who would love, love, love to play either one of those women. They're just so amazing and complicated and wonderful. But it's also two ambitious women with basically zero opportunities you know they're trying to make an opportunity come up and you know that time right. existed before so now they're both going for the same thing mm -hmm. but, you know it makes it more uh direct and, and intense. yeah so you know we've been talking a lot how this the wasps you know really only flew for two years but both books are really about the whole trajectory mm -hmm. and then i mean especially after the fact and you know, starting to get recognition for these valiant efforts and how much work they did. So Elena, I will start with you. Why, and especially because you said earlier that you had initially written the book as those two years. Mm -hmm. So why go on to expand it? Why write it this way where essentially, you know, the, the wasp is at the end of her life looking back as opposed to, you know, an adventure in real, in the time. Yeah, so for, for, for a few reasons. So I think when I originally wrote the book, I had like a different vision for what the character arc would be. And I kind of thought that like, maybe the type of woman or a type of woman to enter that program would be kind of like hard headed and like proud or so I had like this kind of vision of her arc as being like, you know, this kind of maybe a little what we would call unlikable and then like kind of learning, like growing by the experience. And when I was, when we were submitting it, um, we just kept getting rejections because especially like eight years ago, I think like it's the industry is changing quickly, but we were hearing a lot more back then um, about unlikable women and like kind of getting rejected. So I, I just wasn't able to publish it is like the main reason. Um, and then but I'm glad that I that I didn't because mm -hmm. then, then like um, four years later when I wanted to kind of reapproach the story because I was like there's you know I, I still you know four years ago was before Kate's book was out and I was like there still isn't you know we're not hearing about them in just like general pop culture um, so and by then I had had two books published and now I've kind of established my voice at, differently like I'm, I'm kind of like more you know more contemporary kind of domestic sometimes. Um, so I was like interested in how, you know, that that's what brought me kind of to the contemporary story is like, what would have happened then after those years? And I kind of imagined, you know, through the fifties, which was like, like, in, I mean, it wouldn't have been an experience singular to the WASP because like there was such a huge like mm -hmm. domestic workforce during World War II that had now like gone to factories and replaced these men while they were gone and proven themselves to be adequate and then were all kind of sent back. So it was it was almost a universal experience. I mean, these were like, you know, such heroes because they were up in the air and doing these daring things that like we seriously like it was it was very amplified an ex experience, but it was not unlike 
what their peers would be going through. And I kind of imagined it to be similar to like in the twenties when women were having these nervous breakdowns and the doctors would call them hysterical and would like mm-hmm. treat them with isolation, you know, to like make, which only made them more hysterical, right. you know? So like, I kind of imagined Peggy to be in her house in the, the like kind of secluded, unstimulated and frustrated and um, kind of wasted opportunity basically. And what, what she would have been like as a mother then, you know, of to four children and how, you know, her, her children would have suffered because she was underutilized. Um, and if she had like her daughter was her youngest. And so once her daughter came along, you know, maybe she would have tried to projected all of her, um, you know, fears and, um, longings and regrets onto her daughter but maybe her daughter wasn't somebody who really wanted to accomplish Mm -hmm. the kinds of things that her mother did so if she was resisting there would be this natural tension um and then if her if she felt like her daughter never really made something of herself and then that would be a tension that kind of lasted over these decades to when that congressional gold medal invitation arrived um so so yeah that's that's kind of what brought me to that story um and then i wanted to kind of see what ways like the patriarchy and um, has evolved, but not necessarily changed. So like if, you know, during the recession, women were again called to the workforce, you know, and during the pandemic, women were called in different ways to fill in, you know, all these caretaking roles and, you know, homeschooling their kids. And like, it seems like whenever there's a deficit, when there's a need, like women are called to kind of fill in those holes and then again, dismissed. It's like Mm -hmm. this like kind of repetitive cycle. Um, So if her daughter is called to the workforce in a different way, you know, and, and she's kind of facing, I, that she has like a kind of an inappropriate boss, um, you know, and, and, a, and a husband that kind of resents her for, for, you know, earning in ways that he can't earn. Um, mm-hmm. So there's like different obstacles that she's facing that kind of parallel what her mother went through um, during her service. Can I ask you, this is a slightly different, but was this your first book actually? It's uh, not, really not your first published book, but is it one of, it, I, so I wrote like two throwaway manuscripts and then this was like the first novel that I was like okay maybe maybe I can actually do something with it and then yeah then I had to put it away and I wrote two other books that got published and then brought it back up yeah. it's but always those, those two throwaway books will never be will never be upcycled right fair enough <laughs> it's always interesting to see that trajectory you know um even I remember last year I did a session with two debut novelists but one was like, this is really my eighth novel. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> How much writing goes into the book that actually makes it? Yes. Um, and I want to take this opportunity to remind everyone we um, are happy to answer some questions. If anyone has any, Judy has mentioned that Kate's book should be a Ken's Burn, Ken Burns documentary. Oh, thank you. That would be very fun. Yeah. <laughs> that would be very fun. And and I, I just, um, if I can, before we get too far into the questions, if I just can say... Um, Two things, yes, um, I think Elaine is quite right the, about the drafts. I had a full draft of the book that I had a publisher in, interested in, in 2010, and I hated it because it didn't tell the story. It didn't get any, it was very factual, but it didn't get any of the personality, it didn't make you care about these women. It didn't make you cry, which I think, nonfiction should make you cry all the time um but my students love me um but but uh you know and and I have I have all the, the three ring binders of it printed out you know uh like eight of them or something like that so I think uh, Elena's right just keep writing and you're gonna go through a lot of drafts and you're gonna waste a lot of paper though I know people don't use paper anymore but right it it just keep going and if it takes you 10 years to get your book out or 20 years just do it and and just stick with it uh, for sure. And I, a piece of Elena's that I loved is I know a lot of the children of the wasp, right? For the last 30 years, I've got to hang out with the wasp and I spent most of my time with the women. And then as they got older and they didn't, their kids didn't want them traveling by themselves anymore, the kids would start coming to events with them. So I got to know a lot of their kids who were in their 40s and 50s and 60s and by the by the end. Um, and this dynamic of this really strong woman who had this opportunity, and then okay, the war is over, go home, have you know four kids in five years. 
which happened to many of them. One very dear friend of mine had 10 kids in 12 years and it, right. And to know their children, we often joke at, I am so happy that I am their friend and not their child of the wasp, right? That it's so much easier to be their friend because that that dynamic, I thought you did a terrific job of capturing that, Elena, of, and, and it's like, which wasp does she know? Which, you know, because <laughs> you really did a really good job of capturing that, a woman who had these opportunities and that ambition and it had it snatched from her and how that would impact her. So I really, I appreciated that knowing the families of these women. I thought you did a really good job with that. Well, that means so much coming from you. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Kate, um, I want to ask you about flying and how you being a licensed pilot helped your research. And if you know that made you want to um, even research more, or tell us all about it. Yeah, um, you know, I'd always wanted to fly. I think that's partly what attracted me to the WASP story is um, ever since I was a kid, I wanted to be a pilot. I lived near a small airport in uh, up in Omaha and SAC Air Force Base is up in Omaha as well. And it was the 80s. And so the general's planes literally, you guys ever see Red Dawn, right? Omaha is the first city to get hit, right? Because of SAC the general's planes flew over the city. So you could always look up and from the soccer field and see the planes flying overhead always. And um, and then I, I got a job at a flight school in Tulsa, Spartan School of Aeronautics, teaching history and government for their associate degree program and got into that world where I actually got to know pilots and I got to do it. But Going to an air show is how I met Caro and met the Wasp for the first time. So it was all connected, the passion for flying. And then honestly, once I got the opportunity to have flying lessons and start flying, um, it opened the conversations with these women in a totally different way because they're like, you know, they'd start to say something and I'd say, oh, I'm, I'm flying too, or I'm a private pilot. They'd like, oh, 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 okay. Well, you know, and their hands would move and they'd talk about the flaps and they, I mean, it was a totally different conversation. Um, and I happened, my husband's a pilot as well. So like the conversations about some of the engines and that some of the B-29 conversation about the flaps and about the engines. And um, that was very handy. He's a mechanic and a pilot. So it was very handy to have a mechanic in the house to help talk through some of those details as well. So it, it, um, it, it made a real difference, I think, in just my ability to communicate with these women when I was doing the oral histories and then the technical aspect, it was, it was nice too. Would you have been a, been a historian if you weren't interested in flying? That's, I think that's a really good question. I don't know, right? I mean, I, I, I don't know. I, I always liked history. But would I have gone to graduate school to just study history if I hadn't wanted to write this story? I, I don't know. That's a really good question. Oh, <laughs> it's very fair. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Don't. Uh, yeah, I don't know. I don't know if I want to think that deep. <laughs> I mean, it, it does seem like you found something that really interested you and and stayed with it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So and and still... I'm really lucky that that the university, Texas Women's University, the WASP archives are here, and they started in 1993, which is the same time I met Carol and started my oral histories. So oh my their God. collection has grown. I was gathering my own materials as they were starting to gather their materials. And now they're so huge, which is wonderful, but, but it's right there. So every time a wasp would come to their archive, I'd walk across campus and see them. And it was very lucky, very lucky wow. for sure. Yeah. Especially since like academic positions are so hard to get. So, so like, yeah, <laughs> yeah. So like no. Yeah, like no landing there at this at the right time yeah. is like nobody had been, nobody'd been hired there in 10 years when they opened the position and and I was just finishing up my dissertation. Wow. And I had gone and and visited the archives two or three times before that and so knew some faculty and so um the chair of the English department interrupted my interview said oh Katie's here you're hiring her right it's like best <laughs> interview ever it was fantastic meant to be yeah yeah it was really and fortunate then you're you're um well, now I've forgotten um the pre vice president of the wing tip to wing tip association yeah um that's just a really that? small organization we started in um 
2014, uh, we started in 2013 because we, no, that's not right. We started in 2008 because the WASP had a nonprofit or, or uh, community or organization and they were going to disband because they were all getting too old to run it. And they wanted to have one last reunion. So we started Wingtip to okay. support them and to run the reunion. And then we used Wingtip to, um, we got them a Rose Parade float. Uh, you can still find it online. It was beautiful, beautiful, historical, moving exhibit. Um, so we we do those kinds of things. We we do everything we can to support the families and and um, do fun stuff like floats. <laughs> Amazing. Um, so we do have one question from Judy in the audience, and um, she's asking how agents or editors helped you with the process of you know creating your final product. Elena, why don't you start with? Um, so I had two, I mean, I had two agents try to submit it as a full historical fiction and it didn't go anywhere. And then I put that aside and I ended up writing a different book and getting a different agent. Um, so then when I sent it to my agent, she was like, I don't know. And let's think about put it on the back burner. And so I was like, okay. Um, and then and then, I, then when I had this idea of the dual timeline, mm -hmm. I sent her this premise and then we went back and then she was like, it, that said something had excited her about that. Um, so then we went back and forth developing this character and what would the character go like, through in the contemporary timeline. And um, then I plotted it out, you know, a little like in, in you know, four pages, what would these big, you know, plot points be and what would the arcs be? And when we got this proposal into a good situation, um, you know, I had to write like a couple sample chapters in the contemporary, and then I already had the mm. the, the past, so I, I just gave like a you know some samples and sent it to my editor, and then she bought it on you know with that proposal. So like just the outline and a few chapters, which was my first book that I'd ever sold on proposal rather than giving them the full manuscript, um, right. which That's was an common interesting for experience. What did you say? It's common for fiction writers generally yeah. turn in a whole manuscript, which is not the case with nonfiction writers, mm -hmm. just in case right. for folks who don't necessarily know, they're more apt to send a proposal and an outline. Yeah. Right, which is troublesome because like you could spend years then writing a full novel and never have it sold, um, which you know has happened um, and will happen. Uh, but on the flip side, then you like have this proposal and you agree upon a date, but like also you never, like for me, I never know how long it's actually gonna take me to write something, you know, when I'm gonna find the story, like how long it's gonna t take me to like identify what the character is like, mo like being motivated by. Um, so this was like the first time I was under the gun and I was like, I just wrote obsessively because I was like, I'm not sure if I'm gonna make this. <laughs> and I ended up making it in plenty of time, but like and that not knowing and that control is like a whole different anxiety. Mm -hmm. Um, so we do also have a comment in the chat from Kathy, and she really loved her comment of nonfiction should make you cry. I will and say I'm a World War II historian too, so. <laughs> and she's working on a draft um, where she um, has an idea to ID the emotions and put work on stories, ID the emotions, and put them in a spreadsheet. And I just want to say to, to this, last night I was talking to an author who was at our festival yesterday. Her name was Karen Uzule, and she wrote a book um, about flowers. I think it's, I can't remember the name right in front of me, but it's like 600 blooms and, and the, all their meetings. Mm -hmm. And how, you know, their historical, the Victorian uh, times when they put these meetings on them. Anyway, she told me that it was the first, when she submitted this, the manuscript, it was the first time her editors had ever received a manuscript in a spreadsheet form. They'd never <laughs> received anything in Excel before, but she had done all this cross-referencing, there was all these different things. And so they didn't know what to do with it at first, but they thanked her in the end. So that is um, just a comment that I have to share with you, Kathy, about this other event, not that we're, ta we're not talking about right now, but- um, That's fantastic. Yeah, I think it's however your brain works, right? Like my husband is one of my best readers um, and he is a mathematician um, and he's uh, he teaches at, at Endicott College um, for the local people. Um, and when he reads it, he makes a spreadsheet when he is reviewing it where he's like, 
you know, it has chapter, what happens in it, the emotion, the character arc, like he, that's how he needs to look at it visually for when he, like when we're going to discuss it. Um, mm -hmm. And it, it is helpful to have that mapped out. Yeah. Right. We use spreadsheets, you know, to be organized here. And one thing that I hate about them is how, how they hate formatting. They just hate an eye towel. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but anyway, um, so we're almost out of time, but this has been a great conversation. I want, of course, to end with the classic, what are you working on now? Kate, why don't we start with you? Um, I'm working on my next book. It's kind of evolved out of this um, and kind of evolved my agent. Uh, since we talked about agents, I'm going to say uh, my agent is Jen Marshall, um, who is fantastic. And none of what I've achieved with the book would have happened without her. And if you can find a good agent, you know, be nice to them and love them because <laughs> they're, they're amazing. But um, her grandmother was a nurse. And um, she loved the idea of a World War II book on nurses. And so my next project that I'm, I'm actively working on now is on flight nurses in World War II. And uh, I'm particularly focusing on the flight nurses that were in Europe and particularly focusing on one named Reba Whittle, who was on board a plane that was shot down over Germany and was the only American female POW in Germany. Wow, because these these planes they would fly in right near the combat zone, but they couldn't have the Red Cross on them. They would, because they would fill them with ammunition or fuel or whatever they needed to supply the men, and then they would flip down uh, stretchers, put wounded in, and fly them out. And so the nurses would be sitting on top of these things. Uh, so that's that's the next project. It's going to be much shorter. It's a much different experience because um, uh, it's no oral histories to do because they were all so much older. Uh, so it's um, it's a very different experience, but it's it's a lot of fun to to get to learn about these women too. I'm sure there'll be a few moments of um, of tears in that one too, though. Yeah, it just the the proposal makes me sort of. Yeah. <laughs> and you're so good too at like putting a narrative onto these. You know, like it's not like it's you know for people that get are afraid of nonfiction, thinking they're all textbooks. Like it's so story and character driven. Um, oh, so there's nice. like so much emotion in there. Well, thank you. I appreciate that. That was that was something I had to learn. You know, as an academic, you you learn to write a specific way, and and to learn how to. I had to read a lot of fiction. I read a lot of Eric Larson, actually. Mm. Um, his uh, Dead Wake, I think, was my favorite of his that helped me. It's like, wait, I can care about these people because they're real people, you know? So that means a lot coming, especially from a talented fiction writer like yourself. I appreciate that. And Elena, um, what Yeah, I'm, I'm working on a, um, a, a Gloucester opioid story. Um, so- Another a uh, tearjerker, if you will. <laughs> yes, for sure. Um, so yeah, so maybe maybe a future Newburyport Literary Festival be a, a local topic. Um, but for those that don't know, like that, that's is, fiction. It's is fiction, yeah, fiction. fiction. But it's based on historical. I mean, it's like kind of like I, I just like grab a, his, a social justice issue and um, and and write the, a historical a, a fictional piece on it. But it's like. Um, the Gloucester Police Department was like one of the first or the first of its kind to launch a, a drug amnesty program. Wow, terrific. <clears throat> um, and we did have one follow-up asking you, Elena, um, to repeat what your husband does. Did you say he's a mathematician? <laughs> he's, a, he's a math professor at Endicott College. <laughs> well, thank you both so much for being here. Um, Elena, when I saw your book, coming out on the wasps i was like oh i really want to pair with uh, kate so that's yeah really it's perfect great conversation it's so creative thank you for thinking of it it's been such a pleasure it was so fun it was so nice to meet you yeah you as well i hope we can meet in person sometime yeah i'd love it actually uh, there's like that big right this weekend right is the big uh event at the um the at avenger field isn't it this weekend yep yep they have homecoming out there and yeah. you can go and and uh be a part of that i i go um i've been many times i I have kind of paused because the wasps have stopped going and it's kind of hard to go without them there. Yeah. Um, but but I'll probably go back soon, but it's it's prom weekend here and wow. uh, all sorts of things. So um, 
but but I, I'm so happy to have had the chance to do this today. Yeah. Thank you again so much. And uh, we have one more session of the Newburyport Letterary Festival coming up at 445 on food, two very funny food related books. So hope we'll see you there. Thanks again, Kate and Elena. Take care, everyone. Thank you.